top of the hour, which means that uh, we'll be beginning a call from Bill here any second, and uh, that's going to be great. That is going to be great. So we're uh, we're excited to uh, to welcome Bill to the show, and uh, you know, I I talk to a lot of different um, men of God around the country, men that really and women that are really sold out to uh, to the Lord and um, it's it's interesting the commonalities uh, as far as what we're seeing what we believe the Lord is saying to us um, If it was just one fruitcake in a bowl, jumping up and down, screaming and hollering lunacy, you you know, <laughs> throw that in the garbage. But if all of a sudden there's two, three, five, ten, you got to start to go, wait a second, maybe this isn't lunacy. You know, um, shame on me. The lead up to the last election, presidential election, I didn't give um, Ron Paul much more than the time of day. And his supporters, I kind of pushed off to lunatic fringe. Let me publicly apologize. Because not to be political, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not wanting to go down the road of Ron Paul here. But as far as Ron Paul, the Fed... And everything he was saying about our economy, he was absolutely right. His followers were absolutely right. And I pushed them aside thinking, ah, tinfoil, conspiracy, nut jobs. Uh, no, actually, right on, not a nut job. And uh, I can tell you with assuredness that Ron Paul wasn't a, a nut job. I don't think I am. And I know that Jim Williamson isn't either. Jim Good evening, and welcome to Crossing the World. Well, thank you. It's good to be here. Oh, man, let me tell you, the connection we have is just pristine. It's excellent. You're coming in clear as a bell, baby. All right, because I never know with this thing, you know? <laughs> one day it's one thing, and the next day it's a different story, so I'm always holding my breath. No. It, yeah, you're, you're coming in loud and clear, too. Good. Great. Okay, good. We've got a nice, clear connection. We're good to go. <clears throat> All right. Jim, um... We're going to spend the next hour together talking about all kinds of stuff, and uh, as much as you like, you can lead the conversation. But let me first introduce you to our audience, or let let you introduce you to our audience. Who is Jim Wilmanson? You know, where you been? What have you done? And how did you get to here now? <laughs> well, I've had one of those callings all my life. I think that you know nothing has ever been normal or uh, conventional. Um, I got saved initially in 1974. I'm kind of an old guy. and um, No, you're not. No, was, you're not. It was, <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, it was through reading uh, a book of all things, Late Great Planet Earth. And unlike most people, I, I wasn't at the bottom of my game when I accepted the Lord. Actually, I had uh, gone through the Army, a near-death experience. Um, oh, gosh, through drugs, motorcycle gangs, uh, you know, pretty much messed up life, but... Uh, a near-death experience in the Army caused me to really be to sober up, and I got off the drugs. I made a promise to uh, my sergeant when I was in the service that when I got I would use my uh, benefits and change my life around, which I did, and I, I had attained uh, quite a bit for a young man, 23 years old. I had my own business. I had a degree <coughs> in, uh, in the welding industry, and I, I had my own business as an independent artist. And uh, a new child, new marriage, um, owned my own home, looked like I was on top of everything. But I was always keeping up with uh, international news and knowing how it would fit into my own life. And I, I knew that the Vietnam War was coming to an end. I knew that uh, the Arabs were ready to nationalize oil. And I knew with my art business this was going to be a major catastrophe. So it was frustrating that here I had done so much to uh, supposedly, I thought, you know, clean my <clears throat> life up. And yet there were external forces beyond me that were out of my control. And I think it was that kind of frustration that led me to finally you know, pick up the book, Lake Great Planet Earth. It had a prayer, and I, I, I prayed it, and, and immediately, I mean, a transformation that just uh, 
you know, totally blew me away. I mean, I felt this warm blanket of love when I called upon the name of the Lord and, and I got saved. And from there, uh, the Lord, long story short, um, um, had me pioneer and, and foster one of the first evangelical Christian motorcycle ministries. Went back into Detroit and um, evangelized the outlaw clubs. And our, our main thrust was evangelism and <clears throat> reaching an element of society that uh, really had been, you know, pretty much ignored by the, uh, by the church. I'm not blaming them for anything, just, you know, that was an obscure element of society that uh, most people hadn't uh, thought to uh, uh, reach out to. Well, and, you know, 20 years later, 30 years later, there's millions of uh, Christian motorcycle ministries all over the country, all over the world. But I had pioneered one of the first ones. Um, in 1978, I think, is the first time I ever read anything about the uh, sons of God and Genesis 6 and mm -hmm. the Nephilim and everything. So I actually gave my first sermon then, and I told my congregation as I was uh, sharing this, and I really touched the tip of the iceberg, didn't know anywhere near what I know now, but I told them that I said I felt someday that if I ever heard of uh, an interbreeding thing going on again like what happened before, this makes it very up close and personal, and somehow UFOs were, were linked into the, all of this, and if I ever heard of this kind of stuff, then I knew it was gonna, I was going to have to delve into it further. Uh, Twenty years later, in 1996, that's exactly what happened, and uh, I been, began investigating this. <clears throat> I was fortunate in that I had a, a very high-paying job, saved up a lot of money in the bank, and when I got called into this, I began fasting and praying. I'd been laid off from a job, and I looked at my bank account and looked at my life and said, you know what, I'm going to take the next few couple of years off, and I'm going to get into this full-time. And uh, really uh, seek the Lord out and see where this leads me. Um, that led to me um, authoring my book. I actually moved to Roswell, New Mexico, lived there for four years, had a bookstore right across from the International UFO Museum. Uh, took a lot of my experiences from, um, from deliverance uh, ministry that I had in the bike ministry uh, and being able to, to minister, counsel, help people, um, you know, command demons out of their lives and, and just get their heads straight out of uh, drugs and a lot of the you know, depths of darkness that people were in. And I was able to convey that same understanding and knowledge, and, and pretty much the Lord showed me how to tweak it out to uh, address victims of um, alien abduction and other paranormal uh, problems. So today, another long story short, um, myself and my partner, David Ruffino, have uh, PAPSI, the Paranormal and Alien Abduction um, Problem Solvers International, and we have a network of system of pastors, of, of laymen, uh, just anybody that has a compassion and a burden and care for for these kind of victims. We uh, set up a network and mentoring and and help them um, get readjusted to life and offer total termination of their uh, negative paranormal experiences. So that, with along with my ministry and in, in, in informing people of. Uh, Genesis 6, the Nephilim, uh, the activity that happened then and how it's being conveyed over into every aspect of our life today, whether it be politics, whether it be the weather, uh, you know, all of these things are directly involved and goes back to uh, uh, Genesis, 6, Genesis 6 and the Nephilim. So it's kind of like I'm, I'm now doing the Christian X-File stuff, uh, things yeah. that most ministries and pastors are afraid to even mention from their pulpits is what I dwell in and, and try to fill that information gap uh, pretty much full time now. Well, I tell you, what I put on my uh, Facebook today, and as a matter of fact, I sent it out to every single person that I know on all my uh, email lists as well, encouraging them to be here tonight and, and watch the program, is I said that Satan has a counterfeit for everything, including the gifts of the Spirit, and when it comes yes. to the paranormal, this is Satan trying to rip God off. Now, a couple of things I want to do. First off... Um, and, and, folks, you can go to whatever translation you want. I tend to use the NIV, but just for fun, I'm going to uh, read the first five, six verses of Genesis chapter 6 out of the Amplified, just because it's amplified. So check this out. When men began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were fair, and they took wives of all they desired and chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not ever dwell and strive with men, for he also is flesh, but his days shall yet be 120 years. There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterwards, when the sons of God lived with the daughters of men, and they bore children to them, these were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. And uh, verse 4 in the NIV and in the New American Standard and just about every other translation goes this way. The Nephilim or Nephilim 
were on the earth in those days, and also afterwards, when the sons of God went to the daughters of men and had children by them. They were the heroes of old, men of renown. Now, I did a term paper in Bible college on that chapter back in the mid-80s, and the Lord led me to this theory that the, the Nephilim were in fact satanic beings. Now, my uh, the dean of the Bible college said, Vince, this is pretty controversial, and there are some Christians out there that, that agree with you, but man, you're, you're walking on a real slippery edge here. You sure you want to go down this road? And I had such a conviction in my spirit, Jim, that I was right. Now, we didn't talk about the book of Enoch in Bible college in 1986. I didn't learn about the book of Enoch, really. I mean, I saw it referred to a couple of times in the Bible, and it is both in the Old and New Testament, and in glowing terms, not as, uh, this is heresy, don't ever go near the book of Enoch. book of Enoch is quoted, didn't the Lord quote the book of Enoch, or was it Paul that refers to the book of Enoch in a positive light? Explain to, um, people, explain to people what the book of Enoch is, and what it has to say about these Nephilim. Well, in the Book of Enoch, there's there's four different books called the Book of Enoch. There's the Keys of Enoch, the Wisdom of Enoch, um, I think the Knowledge of Enoch, and uh, or Enoch 2. And then there's Enoch 1, the Ethiopic version. Enoch 1, Ethiopic version, the Book of Jude uh, quotes, and the entire book is almost all about what's contained in the Book of Enoch, Enoch 1. <clears throat> there's not one thing in that book that is in conflict with um, the Word of God. Um, and you're right, it's quoted, uh, Paul alludes to some of the material that's in um, in the book of Enoch, but he doesn't directly quote it. Jude, however, co- quotes it word for word in several uh, different places. Um, this book was not added as a canon because it failed to measure up to the uh, proof of authorship. Um, and I think, and I agree with the church fa- fathers, that, that it probably should not have been added only because they were trying to cite on uh, the safety and caution that because they couldn't prove authorship, and there's three different, three or four different distinct writing styles in the book, and it's a pretty thick book. Um, no, I'm gonna, so they just I'm gonna said, interrupt, well, we better keep it out. I'm going to interrupt you. Just about every single biblical scholar, conservative, or way out there nutcase, they all say the same thing. The scholarship and the, the accuracy of the first book of Enoch it may not be canonical, but they look at it and say, there's no question the first book, there isn't anything wrong with it. Well, in the, in the fact that, that uh, Jude quotes and devotes his entire letter uh, surrounded and centered around the book of Enoch, it gives it some kind of a, uh, a level of credibility where, as Christians, we can at least accept this document for its historical narration. We don't have to include it as, you know, canonical literature, but we can look at it the same way we do Flavius Josephus' um, mm-hmm. um, History of the Jews. And when we understand uh, Josephus was trying to win favor back to the Jews, being uh, basically a Roman citizen, that he was trying to make everything favorable. So he was an author of a book trying to win sympathy back to the Jews, and certainly was not uh, a champion of Christianity, this new sect. But when he describes the life of Christ, and he does describe it, he takes a stance of... Uh, of this is current events for him, so he couldn't avoid it. If he's going to do the entire, entire history of Jews, he's going to have to especially mention this guy that was alive, died, and then 400 people saw him after his death. So he, he claims that because he can't deny it, and so he had to include it. But he included it on the idea, well, the least said better. you know. And, and so he makes a comment, and so every pastor on his planet that's uh, well-read always refers back to this little tidbit of Scripture. Now, it's a Scripture. I mean... <laughs> This text of uh, of uh, literature. It's certainly not scripture. It's not something that you can you know, lay claim like that. But we don't shy away from using it because it's a his, a, a piece of historical narration that complements what's in the scriptures from person even who who was not a champion of um, uh, anybody that was a follower of Christ. So. We like to use that, but then you start using the Book of Enoch, and I think there's confusion there because a lot of uh, ministers, we throw the baby out with the bathwater. We, if you ever read any of the other Enoch books, uh, they're wacko way out there. They're just so Gnostic in their nature that it just is totally incompatible with the Word of God. But I think everybody confuses uh, all of that as being one of the Gnostic 
uh, pieces of literature, and it's not. It's it's totally compatible with the Word of God. So at least for its historical narration, and being the fact that Jude did quote it, I think there's a, a credibility level there that we should consider the historical narration. And in that book, it vividly describes the pre-flood world, the reason for the judgment. It definitely talks about the sons of God. It's not being the descendants of uh, uh, Seth marrying the uh, descendants of Cain, which is what we call the Sethite lie. Uh, to believe this, which is what most of your, and, and, and this is really how the tables got turned. In the Bible Belt, most of the people believe the liberal um, lie that didn't even enter into the church thought until the 4th century. You go back to the ancient Hebrews, even when they uh, translated the uh, the Hebrew uh, Bible into the Septuagint in, in the, um, the Greek there, they interpret that, they say that in the day that the angels of God for the sons of God, because they fully knew well this wasn't a, a debatable uh, topic. They knew that fallen angels had interbred with the human race, producing this offspring of a hybrid, and it, the Bible says in Genesis 6 that they were there then, caused a whole lot of a mess, and in the last days, just prior to Christ, they're going to return. It says, and also after that. Well, the also after that, how do they return if everybody got wiped out in the flood? Um, the best minds in the world are still debating this, and I don't think any of us have really come to any solid conclusions. I've got my own ideas. It includes something that's even stranger that, that Christians are having a hard time coming to grips with, and that includes the idea that the Bible does teach that, that uh, hell, we, we always point down in the ground, um, we read in the scriptures there's all kinds of stuff that's supposed to come from underneath to the surface. We think of it as some etherical, invisible spirits, but all these scriptures are saying this is very tangible, literal, physical, in-your-face activity that's going on. So the Bible does teach that the earth is hollow. I don't know how it's hollow. I'm not a geophysicist, but I know that there's so many scriptures that prove it that it exists for me uh, because the Bible says so, because Jesus even said so. Well, let, and this let, is important. Let, let, let's, let's put a comma, because I want to come back to that, but... but uh, I love your style of speaking, but I, I want to slow you down because I want to go okay. back. No, 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 buddy, you're doing great. You're doing great. But I want to go back for because I, I suspect we've got some folks who are new to the program tonight, and I, I want them to get something. I don't want them to go, oh, gee, this is X file stuff and weird fringe. No, no, no. The Bible says, in the end times, it will be as in of the days of Noah. It will be as the days of Noah. So when it says that, what do they mean by that? Well, what they mean is exactly what we're talking about right now. What was going on in the days of Noah that's going on today? Because it says in the end times it will be like it was in the time of Noah. Well, what does the Bible say? It says that the intent God looked at man's heart and the intent of man's heart was evil all the time. They were bent, sick, and twisted. Does that sound a little bit like today? I think so. Beyond that, we have this passage that seems to indicate pretty strongly, and if you go do the scholarship yourself, you're going to end up with that same word, Nephilim, that you're going to have to deal with. And what does it mean? And you're going to, if you'll, if you'll take the challenge... You're going to come to the same conclusion, because I've spent years studying this. You're going to go, this actually says angels somehow had sex with women and had offspring. How the heck did that happen? That's why God wiped out the world, flooded it all. Okay, Vince, well, then, if that's accurate in days of Noah, then what the heck's happening now? Jim, take it away. Well, we're told, uh, you know, now, a lot of people, uh, naysayers, to saying, well, that can't happen, you know, because Jesus said they're neither, neither given nor taken in marriage, uh, so they don't, you know, they can't, angels can't have sex. No, you look at that scripture very carefully, and even go back to the Greek uh, in Peter where it says that um, for they are neither, neither given nor taken in marriage. The idea there is that is the order of things. They're not to do that because that's the way the order is. It doesn't say that they can't do it physically. It just says they don't because that's not their order. Um, we're told in Jude 6 that they left that natural order, and they left their physical bodies and became something else so that they could cohabit. This is the whole purpose of the judgment uh, in that time anyway. Peter confirms that. He says that angels had sinned. Well, what was their sin? Well, they crossed over somehow and were, had the ability and took wives from human beings. Okay, I'm going to uh, put a comma beings. there. Put a comma there again. 
Folks, we're talking about fallen angels. Now, sadly, most of us run away from the spiritual. We run away. Who We don't even want to admit there's a Satan. But Satan is the most foul. He, he, is, he is the incarnate of evil. He does everything he can, including trying to murder Christ and destroy him. So if you've got someone that is that evil, that bent, that twisted... Gee, wait a second, Vince. If all of the fallen angels look to Satan as their leader, and Satan wants to destroy man, gee, maybe maybe this could have happened then. Yeah, it could have. It did. Keep listening. Okay, Jim, keep rolling. Okay, well, in the in the book of Enoch, we're given a couple of other things that seem to uh, be happening before the flood. It says, These are the angels who have descended from heaven to the earth and have revealed secrets to the sons of men and have seduced the sons of men to the commission of sin. A commandment has gone forth from the Lord against those who dwell on the earth for, that their end may be, for they know every secret of the angels. Now, in addition to corrupting the human race uh, genetic line, and the whole purpose with that was what? The, in Genesis third chapter, the first promise was that from the seed of a woman would come the Redeemer who would step on the head of the serpent. So, you know, Satan knew this, so what better way than to pretend to be the fulfillment of this promise by coming down, uh, being these superior beings, and, and uh, probably proclaiming to the, the women, the most likely that were moral and chaste or whatever, that uh, you could be the ones, and we're here to fulfill this. And so uh, a deception that hits worldwide um, is put upon the earth, and women cohabit with these uh, things, actually marrying them. And next, we find out that a world of, of a modest population of about what we what exists today was completely seduced, except for eight people. That was Noah and his family. Uh, they were forensically clean. The Bible says that there was a corruption that happened during this time, too. And we always think of it as being a moral corruption. But there's a word there uh, uh, re in reference to um, Noah, that he was pure in his day. And that was a pure... Uh, in a forensic sense, he was genetically pure. In other words, he hadn't succumbed to that, neither had uh, any of the members of his family. But it says that, that God had looked upon the earth in verse 12 in uh, chapter 6 in Genesis, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. You know, we hear in Greek mythology and everything, we see uh, about minotaurs and harpies, and you know, part human, part animal things. Uh, and literally what's being told here in Genesis 6, 12, is that this was a corruption, or uh, you look in the Hebrew, it was an alteration of the natural course or pathways of the animals. In other words, this is alluding to genetic manipulation. The very sciences that were on the tip of our understanding, uh, right now we, we are on the verge of, uh, with CERN, you know, uh, creating uh, possibly wormholes or, or energy that's able to go at relativistic speeds. It bends time and space and our sense of time and space. A lot of the Nazis were working on this stuff as early back as the uh, 1940s through Operation Paperclip. We started gleaning some of that technology. They were way far ahead of us. What's unique is they got how they obtained their technology and their knowledge. They claim to have gotten it from, from several different sources. One was through channeled um, um, mediums who had contacted their so-called ancient um, gods from the Aldebaran system, so I guess you would say aliens, and they actually got the uh, blueprints and everything for one of, for an engine unlike anything we've ever heard before, and it, it included implosion, vortex uh, technologies, um, utilizing mercury as, uh, as, a, as a plasma for whirling um, elements around at relativistic speeds without friction that actually created an anti-electromagnetic forms of energy, or what we would call UFOs. This sounds like way out, far out stuff, but there's a historical paper trail that's easily made available now that, that can be found. There's many books written on it that the source of all of this activity goes back to the Nazis based on their occult beliefs and their occult sciences and practices that were way outside of the box. The unfortunate thing is they were so far outside of the box that they found things that conventional, traditional scientists were not allowed to look at or couldn't venture into or couldn't get any backing for. But um, <clears throat> with them, they got all the backing in the world, and they found some of these secrets. Too late to, to do anything for the war, but it was certainly enough that we gleaned and, and have taken it to the next step. But unfortunately, bringing their activity over, their scientists over, also came their occult beliefs, which was theosophy, which is the foundation of the New Age movement, but at the same time was the very essence of the philosophical movement of the Nazis. What made the, It was their religion. It's what made them be and what they were and, and who they are. And that has kind of morphed itself into our society today as under the guise of the New Age movement. Um, but 
this technology and the occult beliefs went hand in hand. But guess what? That's exactly what happened during the time of the flood. And we're just seeing this come back full circle. Even the symbol of the swastika was very likely, by, based on the writings of Helena Blavatsky, was the sign for the sons of God when they came upon earth. It's the oldest icon on the world, and it was the icon probably of the sons of God. And then their new regime that tried to bring back the people and the technology, that was the entire Nazi agenda. The super uh, race. They're all one and the same. The super race. Um, this is fascinating stuff, and it's it's a lot of what you're saying is very comparable, and I believe you know Tom Horn or know of yes. him, and Tom's mm -hmm. been the uh, guest on the program several times. Uh, you need to lift him up in prayer. Tom, unfortunately, had his house burned down a couple of weeks ago, but Tom has written several excellent books on the whole idea of, uh, and I mean, it, this isn't out there. This is legitimate science that's being practiced today, legitimate science, where they are literally trying to build what Tom calls chimera, uh, human-animal hybrids. We'll use some genes from this human, we'll use some genes from this wolf, this pig, what have you, and we'll see what we get. Tell you, there is weird, weird stuff going on in the world today. Now think about it for a second. If Satan is bent and twisted, and the majority of men have given over to Satan either knowingly or unwittingly, does it not make sense then? that all of this stuff is going on. But we got to take three steps back. First off, you've got to challenge yourself. Do you believe the Bible? Do you believe in spiritual things as the Bible lays them out? You see, because if you don't believe the Word of God, and if you don't believe the spiritual things, which are part of the Word of God, then everything we're saying tonight, you're going to go, these guys are freaky, whacked, and nuts. No, we're not. You've got to get real with the Lord as far as you, you can't cut parts of the Bible out that you don't like, don't understand, or afraid of. And you can't cut out the spiritual parts of God. You can't do it, people. Do you believe in Satan? Because sadly, a whole lot of you, when I say you, it may not be our audience, but those who go to church on Sunday, they don't even believe in Satan. They don't believe in eternal damnation. They don't believe God's going to judge. Like I said at the beginning of the broadcast tonight, I believe the whole book. All right, we've got a lot more with Jim. Jim, I'm just, uh, you, you put your feet up for about a minute and a half. I'm going to take a commercial break, buddy, and then uh, we will... Uh, Keep at it. This is awesome, man. I am so very okay. grateful. Hey, just before we break, uh, give folks your website and your book. Okay, my book is uh, Beyond Science Fiction. You can get it on Amazon or Barnes & Noble. And my website is echoesofenoch 